This is the Hawker Hunter, an aircraft that emerged as a trailblazer in military aviation. Since its inception, the Hunter has stood as a symbol of military aviation prowess for an astonishing seven decades. The Hawker Hunter was not just a technological marvel. It was a genuine record-shattering phenomenon, standing shoulder to shoulder with the most renowned jet fighters in the annals of history. The moment Nazi Germany unleashed the Messerschmitt Me-262 into the skies, a new chapter in aerial combat was written, heralding the jet age. With turbojet engines propelling them to unparalleled speeds and performance, these aircraft made propeller-driven planes seem like relics of the past. The world quickly realized that mastery over jet technology equated to dominance in the airspace. However, the dawn of jet fighters was marked by tumultuous experimentation and unpredictable results. Nations around the globe faced harsh lessons in their quest to harness this new power. The United Kingdom was no exception. But their initial challenges came not from design flaws or hazardous technology. Instead, they rose from a period of inaction. In the aftermath of World War II, the United Kingdom operated under the assumption that the world would enjoy at least a decade free from major conflicts. This provided a perceived respite, a chance to recover from wartime tribulations and refurbish their arsenal at a measured pace, without the urgency to innovate. The Gloucester Meteor, which was Britain's top fighter jet at the end of World War II, represented the height of technology in 1943. However, as time moved forward into the post-war era, what was once cutting edge quickly became outdated. New and more advanced jet fighters from around the world surpassed it, and the Meteor could no longer keep up with the rapid advancements in aviation technology. While it had once been a source of national pride and aeronautical achievement, it inevitably fell behind, highlighting the need for innovation and advancement in Britain's military aviation capabilities. Unlike their American and Soviet counterparts, the British seemed content to delay addressing this glaring issue. During this critical period, the British government fell into a state of complacency, underestimating the fast approaching challenges of the Cold War. They were caught off guard and unprepared for the potential threats that loomed on the horizon, especially from the powerful Soviet Union and its formidable fighter jets. The Hawker Seahawk, one of the aircraft developed in Britain during this time, did show some signs of progress in terms of its design and capabilities. However, it quickly became apparent that it was not enough to face the potential onslaught of advanced Soviet fighters. Its design, featuring straight wings and an older model of jet engine, made it outdated almost as soon as it entered production. The aircraft was teetering on the edge of obsolescence, struggling to keep pace with the rapid advancements in aviation technology. Meanwhile, there were a number of visionary aircraft designers who were coming up with innovative and superior jet fighter designs. These designs had the potential to give Britain a much-needed edge and secure its position in the skies. However, the government's hesitation and lack of urgency held them back. There was a reluctance to move forward and adopt these advanced aircraft designs, and as a result, the nation's air defences were left vulnerable. The country was at risk of being outmatched and outperformed by the Soviet Union. By the time 1948 rolled around, a chilling wave of realisation swept across Britain. They were not just falling behind, they were perilously lagging in an arms race that was escalating with a terrifying velocity. The nation found itself in a precarious position, scrambling to catch up with the global powers that were rapidly advancing in military might. Back in 1946, with foresight tinged with desperation, the British government had kickstarted a fervent search. They were on a mission, a mission critical to national security. They needed a jet-powered daytime interceptor, and they needed it fast. This was more than just a quest for a new aircraft. It was a race against time, a race against potential adversaries who were arming themselves to the teeth. Two years into this intense search, in 1948, the Brits sharpened their focus, crystallizing their vision of what this jet interceptor needed to be. They were aiming for the stars, setting the bar at dizzying heights. They envisaged a marvel of aviation, a jet interceptor that could blaze through the skies at a staggering speed of 629 miles per hour approximately 1,010 kilometers per hour, while soaring at an altitude of 45,000 feet. This aircraft wouldn't just fly, it would ascend with rapidity, climbing through the atmospheric layers like a bolt of lightning. And firepower? Oh, they had that covered too. They envisioned their interceptor bristling with guns, 
equipped with multiple low-caliber cannons that could unleash a torrent of fire, ripping through enemy targets with lethal precision. The British were determined. They were on the brink of revolutionizing their air force. The skies were calling, and they were ready to answer with power, speed, and an unyielding spirit. The race was on, and the British were all in, their eyes fixed on the horizon, ready to reclaim their place in the annals of military aviation history. Hawker, the very creators of the Seahawk, had already been pitching Parliament with a revolutionary design, boasting swept wings and a robust engine. Under the innovative guidance of Chief Designer Sidney Camp, Hawker adeptly adjusted their focus to align with the Air Ministry's precise specifications. In the initial 18 months of development, Cam's team tackled crucial design challenges, meticulously determining the optimal tail configuration for a swift jet and repositioning the twin air intakes to the wing routes. In 1950, the Korean War revealed a stark truth as Australian pilots flying British-made Gloucester Meteors were completely outclassed by Soviet MiG-15s, highlighting serious deficiencies in the Air Ministry's air power. This situation quickly shifted the government's stance from complacency to urgent action, leading to an immediate request for an interim fighter. In response to this urgent need, the Air Ministry quickly approved two conceptual designs, one from Hawker and the other from Supermarine, the famed creators of the Spitfire. Hoping for a swift solution to counteract the communist forces in Korea, the British government placed an order for 400 units of Hawker's design to be split between Avon and Sapphire engines. In 1951, the prototype, named P-1067, successfully took its maiden flight, followed by the second prototype in 1952, showcasing the full capabilities intended for production models. By 1953, the Hunter F-1 was ready for its inaugural flight. Although the Korean War had diminished in intensity, the Hawker Hunter proved to be a highly promising design, even setting an airspeed record for jet aircraft at 727 miles per hour. Despite being eventually surpassed by the Supermarine Swift in terms of speed, it was the Hawker Hunter that won the Royal Air Force's endorsement and entered service, while the Swift was discontinued just two years later. The Hunter F-1, despite its groundbreaking innovations, had significant flaws. Both the Avon and Sapphire engines variants encountered numerous challenges. The most glaring issue was the lack of an air brake, forcing pilots to rely on the unreliable method of manipulating wing flaps to decelerate, especially during combat. The Avon engine was prone to surging, particularly when firing the aircraft's guns, causing emitted gases to infiltrate the engine. As a workaround, pilots had to significantly reduce speed to use their weapons, with the F-1 model unable to fire its guns above 275 miles per hour or beyond 25,000 feet without risking an engine surge. Furthermore, the aircraft suffered from a very limited range, highlighted by a tragic incident in 1956 where six hunters were lost during a training exercise due to fuel depletion, resulting in a fatality. Despite being an improvement over the Supermarine Swift, the Hunter F-1's shortcomings were glaring, and efforts were made to downplay these issues. Almost simultaneously, the Hunter saga took an intriguing twist with the introduction of the F-2 variant, boasting the Sapphire 101 engine. This bird took its maiden flight on October 1953, proudly crafted by Armstrong Whitworth in Coventry, and subsequently equipped two squadrons at Watersham until the last delivery in November 1954. Meanwhile, the Hunter Mark III, a unique prototype, boldly diverged from its siblings in pursuit of speed. Sometimes mistakenly referred to as the F-3, it carried no weapons but harboured an afterburning Avon RA-7R engine and a myriad of aerodynamic enhancements. As the mid-50s approached, the Hunter F-4 entered the scene, carrying the torch with its bag-type fuel tanks and improved engine. Its maiden flight in October 1954 signified a seamless transition, ensuring the Hunter's continued presence in the UK and Germany until the end of the decade and beyond in training units. Not to be outdone, the Hunter F-5, powered by the Sapphire 101 engine, gracefully joined the fray. From its first flight in October 1954, it served diligently at three bases, showcasing the adaptability of the Hunter series until its withdrawal from service around the end of 1958. The Hunter F-6, a formidable single-seat interceptor, brought forth significant aerodynamic advancements and a powerful Rolls-Royce Avon 203 turbojet engine. From its first flight in January 1954, it solidified the Hunter's reputation, 
serving widely in various locales until the late 1950s. The series further diversified with the introduction of specialized variants, including the F-6A, adapted for RAF Brody, and the two-seater trainer T-7, and its Royal Navy counterpart, the T-8, ensuring that the Hunter's legacy extended well into the training realm. As the Hunter series reached the zenith of its evolution, the FGA-9 variant emerged, showcasing the aircraft's adaptability as a single-seat ground attack fighter. Modified from F-6 airframes, it bore the enhancements and ruggedness necessary for its demanding role, adding another illustrious chapter to the Hunter's rich story. Over the span of nearly two decades, the Hawker Hunter series exhibited a masterful blend of innovation, versatility and excellence. Each variant, each modification, served to enhance and extend the Hunter's capabilities, leaving an indelible mark on the annals of aviation history. The Hunter featured a single-seat cockpit, a swept-back wingspan of 33 feet and a formidable length of 45 feet, all while weighing just over 7 tons when empty. Though its combat range was a modest 385 miles, the addition of external fuel hardpoints enabled it to embark on journeys up to 1,900 miles at its furthest reach. The aircraft was armed to the teeth, featuring a removable gun pack with four 30mm revolver cannons and four underwing hardpoints capable of carrying up to 72 rockets, various missiles, bombs, or even larger drop tanks. This made the Hawker Hunter not only faster, but also more heavily armed and with a superior climb rate compared to its contemporaries, the Soviet MiG-15 and MiG-17, and the American F-86 Sabre. In 1956, during the Suez Crisis, the Hawker Hunter showed its strength and reliability. Stationed in Cyprus with two squadrons, it played a crucial role in protecting British bombers, proving itself in challenging conditions. Missing the Korean War, the Hunter's potential as a major international conflict participant remained untapped with its designated role as an interceptor quickly overshadowed by the English Electric Lightning's speed and prowess. Instead, the Hunter found a new stage within the Royal Air Force's elite display units, the Black Arrows and the Blue Diamonds, where it performed record-setting aerial maneuvers. Transitioning roles, many Hunters were repurposed as training aircraft or transformed into the FGA-9 ground attack variant, becoming lethal against ground targets. However, as these transformations took place, the era of the Hawker Hunter serving with the RAF was gradually drawing to a close. Yet, its legacy was far from over. Captivating over 40 nations worldwide, the Hunter became a global icon, proving its worth in diverse skies. In the Sino-Indian War and the Indo-Pakistani conflicts, the Hunter showcased its superiority against MiG and American-produced fighters, asserting its dominance and compelling adversaries to withdraw. Remarkably, the Hunter's combat history extended to Lebanon in 2014, marking its final retirement and showcasing its agility as a star performer for Switzerland and Singapore's aerobatic teams. Astonishingly, Zimbabwe's Air Force continued to operate Hunters as of 2022, a testament to the aircraft's durability seven decades after its inception. The Hawker Hunter, crafted for a time it never saw, found its stage in diverse global conflicts, outperforming its American and Soviet counterparts, and cementing its legacy as an iconic British fighter jet. If you enjoyed this content, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe for more, and ring that notification bell to stay updated on our latest posts. Thank you for your support.